Suppose your local station gets a train every 10 minutes on average, and you show up to the station at a random time. How long would you expect to wait for the next train? Is it A, 5 minutes, B, something else, C, we don't have enough information, or D, this is an obvious foreshadowing, just tell us why it's not A already. One of my main interests in transit is scheduling, and today I thought I'd make a quick video to share a new perspective of talking about train schedules. But first, I want to set the stage a little. When it comes to taking a transit trip, you may find yourself needing to do some planning ahead. Whether that's because trains are infrequent, you have to change between lines, or maybe you even have to book in advance. With that in mind, I thought I'd divide rail services into three largely distinct types, but as with any classification, it can be a little fuzzy. For the first type, you have services that run at a high frequency where lines almost never overlap and you don't have to check a schedule ahead of time. This is where most metro systems will be. While you can usually just show up and go whenever you want, there's a good chance that your trip will involve multiple lines, especially on larger systems. So you do need some implicit understanding of the network. Metros rarely have interlining because they are designed for maximal frequency on the whole line. Sometimes you'll even have lines whose trains are incompatible with the others. The next type is the opposite, when you don't have high frequency, but also don't require a thorough understanding of the network. This is where you'll find long distance inner city trains, including modern high speed rail. These will often be something that you plan way in advance, where you select an exact departure that you wanna take. It's not that transfers never happen, but rather they are more likely to occur at large central stations in major cities, rather than strategic waypoints on the rail network itself. Of course, it is sometimes possible to book these trains last minute, but in general, it's not what most people will do. As you might be thinking, lots of rail transit lies somewhere in the middle, where you'll need both an understanding of frequency and the network layout. You may have to ride multiple lines like a metro, but you also might consult a schedule if your trip isn't in the densest part of the network. This is often the case with suburban rail and regional rail, but sometimes even tram and light rail systems fall into this category thanks to having interline sections in the city center. These are the types of rail systems where you're most likely to hear the hallowed phrase, trains per hour. Often abbreviated to TPH and often written all lowercase, trains per hour is exactly what it sounds like. How many trains pass through this station or segment of track every hour? Usually it's also implied that this is per direction, but saying trains per hour per direction is a little clunky. As an example, the Washington Metro's densest corridor is the tunnel shared by the blue, orange, and silver lines in the center of DC. During off-peak hours, each of the three lines runs five trains per hour. So combined, there are 15 trains per hour. However, this metric is only useful if you're traveling entirely within the shared section between Roslyn and Stadium Armory. If you wanna to get to the parts where those lines start to branch, that number is going to be a little less. Courthouse Station, for example, is only served by the orange and silver lines, not the blue. So going from the central tunnel to Courthouse actually only has 10 trains per hour. So one every six minutes, right? Yes and no. If you look closely at the schedules, you'll notice that the orange and silver lines aren't evenly spaced. The gap from orange to silver is five minutes, and the gap from silver to orange is seven. If you arrive at the station at a random time, it's slightly more likely that you will fall into an interval where the orange train is the next one. The difference in the gap sizes isn't that bad, but for a more extreme example, now suppose you're going from the central tunnel towards New Carrollton. This branch sees all orange trains, but only half of silver trains. Now the gaps are a little more complicated. You have the same five and seven from before, but because half of silver line trains aren't there anymore, there's now another 12 minute gap and the scope expands to 24 minutes not 12. If you arrived at a random time for this trip, half the time you'll be waiting for that orange train after the 12 minute gap. There are three trains per 24 minute cycle, which when scaled to an hour, means that this trip has 7.5 TPH, or just one every eight minutes. But does it really feel like there's one every eight minutes, thanks to that huge 12 minute gap? This right here is the motivation behind a new metric that I've come up with that I'm calling effective trains per hour. It aims to adjust the TPH figure to more accurately reflect the fact that trains might not be evenly spaced. To derive this effective TPH, 
Let's first discuss how to work out the expected wait time for a trip. This is where the math starts, but I'll try and keep it simple because this isn't my second channel. By the way, do not subscribe to my second channel. The expected wait time for a new video there is like almost a year. Anyway, to find the expected wait time, start by listing all the possible intervals. For Central Tunnel to the new Carrollton trip that we just discussed, that's 5, 7, and 12. Now you'll want the probability of landing in each of these intervals if you show up at a random time, which is just the length of the interval divided by the length of the whole cycle, in this case 24. Now for each probability, multiply by half the interval's length, which is the expected wait time in an ideal world when all trains are evenly spaced in that interval. Finally, add up all the terms. So for this trip, you will find that the expected wait time to two decimal places is 4.54 minutes. It's a tiny bit more than 4 minutes, which is the sort of best case when you have trains every 8 minutes evenly spaced. Once you have the expected wait time in minutes, you need to transform it back to a unit on the same scale as trains per hour. To get from the length to the expected time, we divided by 2, so now to undo that, multiply the expected time by 2. This will be just a bit over 9, which is to say that the weighted average interval between trains is just a bit over 9 minutes. But let's keep going. To get from minutes to hours, divide by 60, and to get from hours to per hours, take the reciprocal. Once you do all of that, you'll finally have that the effective trains per hour of this trip is 6.6. .6. So what does this number tell us? It tells us that despite there actually being 7.5 trains per hour from the Central Tunnel to New Carrollton, the uneven spacing between them means that it's as if there were only 6.6 .6 trains per hour, which is about one less. And there you have it. But before we go, let's try one more example, one that I think is even more frustrating. Metro Electric in Chicago has three different branches that each run hourly off-peak. You'd hope that they would be nearly 20 minutes apart, as close as possible. But unfortunately, when I was there, I had narrowly missed a train and got stuck waiting for over half an hour. So if you told me on that day that there were three trains an hour in the core section, I would not really agree with you. The trip that I took that afternoon was from 59th Street to Millennium Station. Ignore the skip stops for now, let's just look at the gaps between trains. The shortest gap is 12 minutes, then there's one that's 15 minutes, and finally the largest one is 33 minutes. The expected wait time formula for these numbers is here on screen now, and when you work it out it comes out to exactly 12.15 minutes. So that means the weighted average interval is 24.3 minutes, a fair bit more than 20, and finally the effective trains per hour is 2.47, which means that it's effectively like there's one less train every two hours. Now in this instance, the travel times are actually different, and to be fair to Metra, the trip with the longest wait is the one that skips the most stops, which saves a grand total of one minute? Huh? Honestly, Metra's obsession with express service is a problem in and of itself that's been discussed by people who know far more about Chicago than me. But on that note, if you're based in Illinois, check the video description for how to help fund Chicago's transit. So to conclude, I don't think these metrics are that useful to the average rider, who probably will check the schedules in advance if it's a particularly long trip, or just use their phone's navigation app. However, it is a useful thing for transit operators to think about, especially those who want to pivot away from commuter-focused service and be more equitable throughout the day. Especially in these kinds of regional rail networks with lots of interlining, what makes them shine is not only how they bring the suburbs closer to the city, but also that they can be a fast way of traveling through the city itself. Take BART for an example. Per the latest data, about a sixth of BART riders who enter or exit a station in San Francisco have the other end of their trip also at a station in San Francisco, so they're not using a transbay tube or going south of Daly City. That's a train every four minutes, and in general the spacing is pretty close to even, especially in the southbound direction. Though there is one particularly bad example, where the northbound green and blue trains are so close together, which is a major problem for if you're going from San Francisco to places like Fruitvale, Coliseum, or Bayfair. For that trip, the ideal expected wait time is 5 minutes, with even spacing, but it ends up being nearly 7.5 minutes when you account for the size of the gap. Obviously, the more interlining and branching that you have, the harder it will be to maintain even spacing. Or perhaps there are specific points on the network where you want trains to arrive very close together to allow for a particularly important transfer to be as seamless as possible. Optimizing rail operations is all about those trade-offs though, 
And so I'm pleased to use this as an opportunity to make a semi-formal announcement that I'll be spending the next 12 months getting my master's degree in transportation engineering. I'll still be making videos, maybe not as frequently, but definitely more rigorous where needed. But the fun stuff won't be going away. Speedrunning is never gonna die. So to go back to the question I posed at the start of the video, the answer is indeed C. We don't have enough information. The key word in the question was average, and never specified anything about the spacing of the trains. And as you saw with the BART example a moment ago, the further you are from even, the worse the expected wait time becomes. But if you still think the answer is D, I don't blame you. 